Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and on today's web DM, we're going to reach out to all you DMs that are experiencing a little bit of RD, resurrection dysfunction. It's nothing to be ashamed of, it happens to everyone, but we're going to give you the diagnosis to get you back in the game, and more importantly, back in the action. Let's get to it on web DM. Let's talk about <laughs> resurrection and raising the dead, the save feature of D&D. The save feature of D&D, much maligned by dungeon masters everywhere, and yet I've never seen a player complain about resurrection and raised dead. I don't think I've ever read of a player being like, man, that resurrection magic just ruined the game for me. It's usually a D DMs who kind of talk about how it's difficult mm -hmm. to establish sort of w worlds and, and take into account the fact that raised dead and resurrection magic e exists for their setting and what the implications are for it. If you think about it in a metagame sense, if you look at like any kind of comic book, like Marvel, like the villains are constantly being resurrected, right? <laughs> villains like, heroes they never like die. coming back all they over the place. Die, right? They never die, right? They're playing in a D&D world. Right, and so I think the tension exists because there are DMs out there who want uh, there to be lasting consequences for their games. Yeah. They want death to mean something. They want uh, players to have an incentive to be not risk averse, but mm -hmm. certainly like to consider the risks involved and not just charge in foolhardy, knowing that the cleric's going to bring him back real quick. Right. He's and, got revivify prepared. Fuck right. This. Of course he would. And so the player side of it, which is that they develop attachments to their characters that they want to maintain. Yeah. And while my, I'm of the opinion that character death is an opportunity to play a new cool character. It just is. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't play that way, and they want to see the same character go from first to twenty and have that emotional mm -hmm. satisfaction of doing that, while at the same time doing all these risky, dangerous things. And yeah. so, the resurrection magic, along with things like greater and lesser restoration and all the cure spells, do kind of create a save feature that allows your character to engage in this risky behavior. Mm -hmm. And and if if it goes south. It, it's okay, yeah. they'll come back. And so the, the tension I, I see online a lot is is between those two things. Yeah. Dungeon Masters wanting to create a, a plausible, believable world that that has uh, consequences and players wanting to maintain that attachment to their character. So what do we do about resurrection magic? I think banning the spells outright is a little drastic. Even, Even if only for one uh, module? <laughs> I mean, for one module is one thing. Uh, Look you know, at a YouTube of Annihilation. We'll get to that, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> definitely gonna talk about it. I think starting out, it's, it's worthwhile to look at the four, maybe five ways that it's possible for player characters to bring other player characters back from the dead. Let's go ahead and get the cantrip out of the way, general repose. That right. thing that can get you to <laughs> being raised, like if you're right. out and whatever. So, you know, something's dead, cast yeah. general repose on it, it doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't deteriorate. So general repose is kind of one of those spells that is is related to that. It keeps the corpse fresh. <laughs> there is magic that, uh, mm. you know, the early level resurrection magic, it does, it does have a shelf life. You know, yeah. it can't be passed either if it's one minute or 10 days. So general repose does kind of like keep the, keep the body fresh. Fun tip, you can also use it on a newly risen lich to kind of keep them uh, Fresh from deteriorating. Her flesh right? starts to deteriorate. Um, Otherwise, you might have to <laughs> stuff a body full of snow to keep it fresh, right? Like, right. <laughs> there's that one. There's spare the dying, of course, which isn't quite resurrection magic, but it is in that gray space where you're making those death saving throws. It's to keep you from that, though. Keep to keep you from that. But I'm talking specifically about revivify and, and moving on. Yeah. Now, I personally think that revivify is the problem. And it, if, if there is any one of the spells that I would just say, we're not playing with this one, yeah. it would be Revivify. First off, it's way low level. Fifth level is early to be able to get that kind yeah, of stuff. for a third level spell? It's a third level spell, right? So I, I can remember us playing way back in the day in like second edition where you know, we're out in the middle of the trackless wilderness, someone's character dies, and now we do have to stuff their body full of snow and drag them back on a sled three weeks to civilization where we then negotiate a price with the temple. It's not just gold they want, they want favors, they want other stuff. There's a resurrection survival chance for that character to come back. Mm -hmm. There's like all of these hurdles you have to jump through to get a character back to life. Yeah. So that by the time your clerics were actually casting Raise Dead and Resurrection, if they made it to that level, that was seen as sort of an achievement. Now now someone else can do that. Putting Revivify at 
available to, to fifth level characters means that as long as that person stays up, as long as that character that's able to cast Revivify mm -hmm. stays up, they're going to be able to bring everybody back unless yeah. it's like a really bad situation where they've got no slots left, that minute casting time, or that, sorry, that minute shelf life that the corpse can be a corpse <laughs> is, you know, you're going to blow past that. But I do think that Revivify is the one that creates that whack-a-mole uh, sort of feel. There's certainly the fact that you can go from zero to there's no negative hit points you have to 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 account for right, you just right. drop to zero and then the next time you you get hit you're now you're making the three death saving throws again i think there's a lot of things that make fifth edition very newbie friendly in that regard yes. and i yes. think that's a good thing for new players but it it does have consequences on dms and the worlds they want to create yeah because then you just you just circle the wagons around the cleric and just keep him alive right you know right uh, and so revivify i think is is one of the major culprits of that because then they can just like eh, bring people back bring people back bring people back right as we get into the higher levels of raised dead magic whether it's raised dead resurrection or true resurrection i think those are fine there's nothing necessarily wrong with those number one they're higher level so it's going to take longer to get to them there's going to be less characters in the world, whether PCs or NPCs, capable of using that magic. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think they're less disruptive than Revivify. Yeah, also there's some drawbacks, some limitations on them. Right. So let's let's get into that. Raise dead, you know, that's what, 10 days? Yeah, the, the person that you're trying to, to, to raise can't be dead for longer than 10 days. That's where Gentle Repose comes in, conveniently enough, lasting for, I believe, 10 days. I like it because it's it's sort of like the Forgotten Realms equivalent of a week, right? A 10 day. A 10 day, I yeah. think that's probably, uh, why it's in there. Um, but the Raised Dead has a curious thing where it can bring back someone that's died of old age. Most of the other resurrection magics mm -hmm. can't do that. Raised Dead is sort of the exception to that. I think there are some interesting world building implications because of that. Yeah. But I mean, like all of these spells, they've got expensive material components. They've got a shelf life. You have to cast them within a certain time frame. You know, particularly Revivify, I think that one minute is needs to be strictly enforced. A lot of times, once you break out of combat, tracking <laughs> what happens round to round becomes less you know, less uh, rigorous, but a minute isn't that long. And it's, it's, and so if something happens uh, or, or if there's a problem or an issue, uh, then they might not get to them. But uh, the limitations on all of the resurrection magic, I think mm -hmm. sometimes get forgotten about in the rush to ban or modify or change these spells. Yeah. Where it's like, hey, this magic might not be everywhere. At the same time, you know, a lot of the complaints come from just a, a pure player focused perspective, not necessarily what the random dirt farmer NPC is doing, but like the fact that the players keep coming back. Uh, from that, is, uh, yeah, is the yeah, yeah, and also, uh, you know, that hour casting time is. Oh yeah, you know, you can't. You're not just going to bust this out in the middle of combat. Certainly not. Ra <laughs> certainly no. not raised head or resurrection or the other. That'd be a very interesting uh, <laughs> combat. We need to protect the cleric while he casts raised dead on could, the king. One of the things that I like about these spells is that you know the player's handbook spells present uh, one way to, for this magic to work, mm -hmm. but it's entirely within the DM's purview to say yes, you can cast raised dead, but it has a requirement of being in this specific location. So now we're kind of dealing with like a Conan Barbarian situation where you have to prepare the corpse to be brought back. Right. And there are ghosts that are going to come and attack the party while right. the cleric is trying to bring back this character because you are calling their spirit from the netherworld. That opens the door. There are vengeful spirits that will come through. The yeah. rest of the party has to keep that cleric safe while that's happening. Those are the kinds of things you can start working into resurrection magic mm -hmm. instead of just like, yeah, we hole up in the inn and uh, an hour later he's going to come back with, with full hit points and all, all mundane diseases cured. And, and then we have a beer. And then things like that. Right. And then there's also the fact that, you know, uh, you know, body parts that are missing yeah. um, you know not every resurrection spell restores body parts so you know it's not going to regrow limbs uh, re raised dead at least it's not going to regrow internal organs things like that it might yeah. it might help cure or or <laughs> it might uh, you know some resurre resurrection magic you know does restore vital organs and some of them it's like you just say the person's name. True resurrection is like, I'm gonna say this person's name and it's gonna create a whole new body for them and they're gonna yeah. bring them back. Um, but just, you know, read the limitations on those spells and consider what the implications are for them. They're not cheap, number one. No. It might be cheap for the players, right? They might have a lot of diamonds that they're throwing around because they're players right. and players tend to accumulate gemstones like that. But for the world, a three a three hundred gold piece gem, a thousand gold piece with five hundred or twenty five hundred. Those are difficult to come by, mm -hmm. and they should be similarly difficult to come by for the party. If you want to limit resurrection magic without changing the spells or anything, then just make diamonds difficult to find. 
Yeah. Right. Then, then giving a diamond as part of treasure, it becomes more than just gold. That that's a spell component that yeah. the cleric or whoever needs. Yeah. And that's a very good way of limiting this magic. Revivify is a three hundred gold piece diamond. How many of those does your party have? How many of those are you making available for the party? Right. Right. Um, yeah, those are the kinds of things I, I don't really see discussed whenever people, are, you know, kind of gripe about uh, the way this magic works. Yeah, I mean, how does the how does the diamond trade not get thrown off? You know, of course, reincarnation is the bastard stepchild of of resurrection magic. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's a lot more easier to cope with in fifth edition than Pat. Right, you're not coming back as a raccoon or a bear yeah, or something I mean, like that. <laughs> who wouldn't want to come back as a trash panda, a fifth level rogue trash panda? Right. I mean, can you imagine all the things you'd be able to get up to? Sure. Yeah. And then clean. <laughs> <laughs> with your little hands. Right, with your little tiny paws. You know, you're just going to like roll a random race from the, the player's handbook races. I, I kind of think a reincarnation magic should be like location specific. Yeah. Wherever you're at, um, you know, there's a custom table for it because mm -hmm. of the, the critters that are found there. Yeah, so maybe you want to be reincarnated in a full city. <laughs> right. As opposed to out in the as middle of the woods. As opposed to out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, not just Tomb of Annihilation, uh, it, you know, changes the way resurrection magic works, but obviously Curse of Strahd had oh. uh, consequences for coming back from the dead with that one. So I think it's entirely within the Dungeon Master's purview to say, this type of magic is going to work differently. This is powerful magic. Yeah. The door between life and death is a real thing in a typical Dungeons and Dragons world. There is a There are gods and goddesses of the dead. There are powers and monsters and things that usher and guide souls to their whatever reward they mm -hmm. have afterwards. And being able to manipulate that is gonna be powerful magic. So yeah. it's worthwhile to think, you know, how can I make these spells a part of the adventure? How can I make it so that it's not just the player going, I cast this spell, some time passes and it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, do you make them a ritual? Right. Do you do you make it something that the group can participate in? Um, the the new uh, Taldorai uh, setting from Critical Role sort of released. Uh, I, I actually got my copy over last week, and the first thing I did was flip through where they have their alternate rules for resurrection, and and, and part of those are like making it a group effort, making everyone, non spellcasters included, able to make some kind of skill roll or check to participate in bringing this person back, but then making it not guaranteed that they're going to come back. Yeah, and bringing back kind of that old uh, system shock role from second edition saying like, yeah, it's traumatic coming back from the dead. And it's, you do not come back unaltered, right. unchanged. I like the idea of like bringing everybody in, you know, bring, setting down mementos of the person, you know, even if it's like the, the non spell casters there offering up a prayer or an item of sacrifice to bring them back. I really like that. This is where you really enforce the, uh, the, the material components. Make it not just a diamond, make it that they've got to you know, acquire rare instances and herbs. Um, <laughs> you know, they have to tattoo the body with certain arcane or, or religious sigils that require mm -hmm. special pigments and inks and things or a special quill that has to be used. Like that's where the DM can really say, this isn't just you saying I cast the spell. Let's role play this out. What is your character doing? What right. materials are they using? They have to go and put some effort into acquiring this. And that's how you make things uh, magical. You invest significance in these in these acts and these items that they have. So that's one way you can do it. Yeah, and and obviously you're coming back from the dead. This has consequences. You're going to come back maybe changed. Like that's one thing I loved about. You're going to come back as Dougie, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's one thing I love like about Game of Thrones when you have right. the character of Beric Dondarrion. Yes. Then he comes back. And it's like there's pieces of you there's that get pieces pulled of you away. Missing. Yeah. And you're just you know you're not the same person. You're not the same person. Walking and... through death's door is a harrowing experience. Right. And so I, it should be. And so are there psychological or physical Physical tolls that, that that get taken on your character. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there's a table in the DMG that's kind of like lasting consequences of death, but there's plenty that you can find online um, that's just like what give give your character a new flaw. Right. Use the indefinite madness to kind of uh, guide your decision making in this and say like yeah uh, you know you're, this is how your character died. Uh, this is the location they were in. Maybe choose some kind of flaw based on that. Some kind of physical uh, limitation that takes a while to come back from. You know were they impaled on a on a uh, you know a dragon's tooth <laughs> whenever they died then then there's got to be some kind of consequences for that maybe yeah. they walk with a limp maybe they're they have difficulty um, with uh, you know holding something I don't know get just finding a way to say like you came back but there the, there was a price to pay and right. that's a, a change in your character and if your character never changes never has something adverse happen to them never has something that they have to overcome 
then that doesn't create for a very rich role-playing experience. Right, right. You don't, you don't actually have a character development arc. Yes, you have a character leveling arc. You sure. leveled up, but you never developed. But you so. never developed. Maybe a, a god or a goddess brings back the character and says, like, well, you can, but now there's a price to pay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a creature that, can, that knows Ray's dead magic, and the party has to approach that creature and beseech them, and now they're in their debt. And that's maybe something cool where it's like, hey, we did this for you. The price that was paid isn't on the character that's resurrected, it's on someone else now. Right. And that kind of creates tension within the party and great opportunities for role playing as it's kind of like, yeah, the person who brought you back was the one that paid the price. Maybe yeah. they had to give a piece of themselves. Uh, we've mentioned it before, Dr. Strange or uh, Dr. Strange and Mr. Norrell or whatever. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Strange. Jonathan and Strange and Mr. Norrell. Sorry. I'd like to watch Dr. Strange and Mr. Norrell. Dr. Strange was <laughs> That'd be an interesting, That'd be uh, an interesting one. Yeah. Who uh, is the Sorcerer Supreme? Yeah, who is? Uh, um, <laughs> ooh, we should do our own fanfic, Jim. You know, making a deal with the fairy in right. order to bring back the right, lady. And half her life is going to be taken by, yeah. You know, that's uh, obviously he made a deal for her yes. and used her as a bargaining chip. Yes. Um, but, like you said, sometimes maybe one of the party members that that creature maybe has a liking to, right. has a liking for. Maybe there's a magic item that, that brings people back from the dead and acquiring it is an ordeal in and of itself. Just take the Lazarus Pit. Right from, right, from Batman. Like, bringing someone, bringing Raj al Ghul back to life in the Lazarus Pit, whoever bathes in that is a, it, it has a price. It does something to them. And it might be temporary. And it might be something that they don't always want to do. But long-term use of it carries its own consequences. If these places exist in your world where it's like, okay, the, the wellspring of life mm -hmm. that's guarded by the, you know, champions of the four elements, you know, that they're not just going to let anybody come up there. Right. You either have to defeat them and, and claim the wellspring for yourself or pass their tests in order to do it. If you're wanting to have the magic that still exists in the world because you don't want to tell PCs when your character's dead, that's it. You got to make a new one. You don't want to do that to them because they're here to play a character long term, but you don't want to make it trivially easy. You can make these things where it's like ritualize the spell, make mm -hmm. them go to a certain location to do it, make them bargain with an entity to do it. Right. Ways to keep the magic in the game, but make it more difficult to gain access to that magic. Another way is to uh, add those that that watch over the, the pathways between life and death. There right. are certain entities and, and, and deities, right? Right. That maybe might have something to say. Absolutely. So we've got we've got the Raven Queen uh, that came into Dungeons and Dragons in fourth edition and sort of and I think is one of the, the better additions, additions to, to the, the game. The editions. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just a really fun concept. We have the inevitables, yeah. these sort of like lawful creatures that that, that some of them are, are out there to say like, yes, you know, resurrection magic. There's, yeah. You got a certain number of limits for it. Oh, those <laughs> extra planar voyeurs. We've got the death curse uh, in, in, in sort of Tomb of Annihilation where it's like, yeah, if you've come back from the dead, you've got a clock, you've got a countdown clock. Tick tock. So those are all kinds of things that, that you can incorporate into your game so that if you do have fragrant, flagrant violators, yeah. it's just like, yeah, this guy gets brought back every session. And yeah. there are, times in Dungeons and Dragons where that might happen. And well, if you're getting brought back every session, you're dying a lot, therefore you would be a fragrant uh, offender. So, <laughs> yes. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, talking about like what happens at, uh, with with the world building, and I yeah. think for a lot of DMs, it's when it comes to world building that they have a problem. There are those DMs who are like, I can't challenge my players because they keep coming back from the dead. Maybe you're running too combat heavy focused a game and you need to just not do that. Um, but there are some who are just like, I can't wrap my head around the world building implications for Raised Dead magic. And so one of the ones that I'm thinking of that pops out immediately is Raised Dead. The fact that you can die of old age. If someone gets to you in time, they can bring you back. First off, who gets resurrected Right, is the big question. Yeah. You well, gotta have that money, right? You gotta have that money. You've gotta have that diamond. And like, who has access to that? Well, obviously, if you're if you're kind of building a standard sort of medieval esque world, uh, those gemstones are going to be very rare. You're talking about aristocrats and and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of uh, very important people yeah, in royalty. your campaign world uh, who have who have access to that. Maybe the trade in diamonds is heavily restricted yeah. by some entity, whether it's the monarch or or whatever government official, whether it's the religious organization. You know, if you have a temple that 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 produces clerics that know resurrection magic, then it might just be like, yeah, you don't get to sell diamonds. They take them as yeah. tax. And if you want to know where the diamonds are, they are in a vault deep underneath the temple where they keep those kinds of things. Yeah, they control the diamond mines. They control the diamond trade. That's just how it is. 
Um, it, you know, you, you've got to think these things through. If the magic exists, it's in the player's handbook, and it's tied with a physical resource that's in the game, in this case diamonds, then there will be people in the game world who are like, yeah, those diamonds are more valuable than, than just their aesthetic appeal. Yeah. It, it's a diamond that you can bring someone back from the dead with. So, Jim, how long would someone live if they died of old age <laughs> and then they're brought back with raised dead? How long would you say they live? I mean, I would say they live as long as their constitution checks <laughs> keep <laughs> keep working. So I, here's the scenario I'm imagining, and I, I can totally see this for like a low fantasy kind of game or something where it's like you have a Cersei and Kyburn situation where there's a yeah. specifically a wizard who has stolen clerical magic. Yeah. Right, whether it's a theurgist or, or something else, could be probably a warlock as well, or maybe even a favored soul, like an arcanist that is stealing magic that's normally reserved for champions of the gods. And you have a monarch who shelters this spellcaster and prevents them from suffering the consequences of their fate. The Inquisition can't touch them. Mm -hmm. the, the Holy Order of Assassins isn't coming after them. They're sort of sheltering them. In exchange for that, this ancient, decrepit, but just absolutely vindictive and power-hungry monarch is kept alive by this spellcaster. Yeah. Did they die of natural causes in the middle of the night? Let's get the spellcaster up here and he's gonna do what he does. You yeah. know, and it's just a steady stream of raised dead, lesser restoration, heals, and just this decrepit, because they don't want to become a lich. They don't want to become a vampire. They like their full life, as it were. Mm -hmm. And and now it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, no one's allowed to sell diamonds in the kingdom. Yeah. No one, no one is allowed. If you if you get caught doing that, the kingsmen are going to come after you. Yeah. It's, it's one way to play yeah, this so, kind of uh, So, yeah, our party of intrepid adventurers come up to the border of this kingdom. <laughs> right. Break out the the gem, laden with gemstones gem as their, they are. Yeah, sure, from their yeah. latest adventure, and all the shopkeeps are like, "No, you, you no, got to get, get the fuck out of here." Got to get right out of here. Yeah. So I, I think that that's one way to kind of present it. The other way is just sort of like, who can raise dead? How yeah. many casters are there in your kingdom, in your empire, in whatever it is that you're creating, who have access to this magic? This is why I don't normally like saying this spell is off limits, but I'd be okay with saying revivify is off limits. Not we're just going to take it out of the game. Like how many casters are there capable of casting fifth level spells, seventh level spells, ninth level spells? Yeah. I mean, in a standard kind of high fantasy world like Dungeons and Dragons, it might be in the dozens or hundreds, but that's up to the DM. Yeah. That doesn't have to be the case. The DM can say there is no one in this world world capable of casting X number of spells above a certain level, right? You could just flat out say, there is no one else in the world who can cast six level and above magic. Just full full stop. No yeah. one's done it. There have in the past, those spells kind of exist in dusty tomes waiting to be rediscovered. But as it stands, you can't go to the high temple and get a true resurrection. Yeah, You can barely go there and get a raised dead. There's like one guy there that yeah. does it. Um, you got to go out and quest for that scroll of true resurrection. Right. <laughs> and so maybe you have a case where aristocrats and nobles and, and, and merchant lords and everything, they have to supply their own diamonds for it. Um, maybe you have a situation where uh, because there's only a handful of people in the kingdom who are able to raise dead, the, the power brokers of that of that place mm -hmm. have a lockdown on it and it's like no we the, if that if so and so dies my raised dead is meant for them i can't cast it on you today because yeah. i don't know when i might need it you know this is where thinking about the setting implications of the world that you're building how many spellcasters are there just yeah. how many people are capable of doing this that's up entirely up to the dm if they're worried about too much magic floating around then limit the number of spellcasters yeah, yeah, because there's a there's a lot in between the an area of sparsity or like a supermarket of of raised dead. Like you just go down, like go down to aisle three and get your revivify. <laughs> right. You know, there's a lot in between there. Yeah, there's a lot in between. You can go the opposite direction, and in, in, in which raised dead magic is really common, and it's in for a certain class of people in the campaign world a common experience, mm -hmm. and and you just sort of take that in stride and say, yeah, you know what, it, it exists, revivify and all. And it, it's just is going to be there and it's going to happen. And the powerful people in the world, which eventually will include the PCs, have access to magic that that the common folk of the, this world do not have. And it sets them apart from others. Mm -hmm. I think the real tension comes is where when DMs want a very medieval-esque world that adheres to kind of a real world standard or kind of a low fantasy standard, but they're playing with the base Dungeons and Dragons rule set and they don't alter it. 
base Dungeons and Dragons is not low fantasy. There is magic all over the place and it can do fantastical things that completely break a kind of real world uh, setting and you need to take that into account. I am a fan of not fighting the system in this regard and working with it mm -hmm. in order to create a rich game world. But there are some DMs who want a different experience and so they're gonna have to change the way these spells work. I think it's better for them to alter them than to ban the spells outright, yeah. but you know, you do what you gotta do for your own table. Yeah, quick capsule. How much of a body do you need for resurrection? Gosh, well, I mean, I guess it depends on the spell, right? Like, no, 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 the spell <laughs> resurrection. The spell resurrection, you no, can, no, because no, I think you can do, I think, I How think much with, do you think? How much of a body do you need? I think you need enough of a body that it's a recognizable body. You know what I mean? Like a torso, a head at least. Yeah, um, even though it says that it grows back all body parts? Even though it says it grows back all body parts, you could get like a fifth element situation where you just have a hand. It, mm -hmm. It's one of those weird things where I think the spell says you target a creature with it, um, which is already kind of weird because if they're dead, they're not a creature anymore. Uh, they I, are it, a corpse. <laughs> they are a corpse, which is <laughs> technically an object. Um, I think that's one of the cases where a, an overly legalistic reading of the rules will get you in trouble, and yeah. the DM just needs to go with what seems right. Yeah. Are they going to be able to bring the head of the sainted one back and and you know uh, place it on the, on on the pedestal or the altar, and the cleric you know casts it, and, and out of that grows magically a flash of light, and there they are. Some legs poke out and start wiggling. Right. And <laughs> I mean, this is this whole thing is, to, is is why I love the Zealot Barbarian, and I hope I hope I hope it makes it into Xanthar's because I just love the idea of someone who's like, yeah, you don't have to worry about that diamond. You don't have to worry about all that. My God is is ready and willing to send me back. Yeah. Like I'm I'm here. I'm back into the fray. Yep. I I already signed my, uh, already signed my NDA. I already signed right. everything else. <laughs> right. I'm good. I well now I'm imagining something. I, we might have talked about this when we talked about the Zealot Barbarian and, and long ago in those Sunday night uh, live shows where our audio was horrible. Um, mm. Where it's like, yeah, there's the champ, the eternal champion, who as long as someone keeps resing him every 200 years, this guy comes back. Yeah. And it's just riddled, scarred up. He always dies in battle. Yeah, it, that's this is, what this happens. Is the whole point, right? But you, <laughs> but when the kingdom needs him, he gets brought back, mm -hmm. lead the armies, and 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 so I, I think that's or it's or the reverse. It's just kind of like yeah, though oh, oh yeah, we've got to deal with that evil warlord again. Shit, like someone who defeated so, him last time. Who defeated him last time? Who keeps bringing this guy back? But it's trivially easy to bring him back from yeah. the dead. Um, so yeah, I I I think bottom line for me is I I think resurrection magic is what makes D and D D and D. Yeah. And if you ban it outright, which is a legitimate thing, there are campaigns where just not having it is a thing. Um, and there's other ways you can have, you can borrow like fate points from Warhammer where it's like I spend a fate point, I'm not really dead, even though I might have failed those death saves, gonna spend that fate point and I come back with a horrible injury or, or something, mm -hmm. um, or insane, and, and that's kind of a way to circumvent that. But I, I think resurrection magic is sort of part of what makes D&D D&D, and it's worth really thinking through what it means for your campaign worlds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His peenar. <laughs> <laughs> you rubbing your damn peenar. Your peenar. You know, you dick. <laughs>